somewhat smaller audience than sometimes it's because the weather, weather is too good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then I will welcome Steve Dilks, and it's a great pleasure to see you. We have many good memories together. Uh, way back in time, we started the FACET, the Faculty, Cent Faculty Center for, it, 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 what was it, FACET? Excellence in teaching. Yeah, we oh, yes. <laughs> we're discussing the excellence part. And um, it came about by uh, votes from uh, faculty who, uh, who, were mem who were invited to a lunch at the old tennis club and it was open bar. And then we discussed this idea and people thought it was a great idea. And uh, we had quite success uh, with programs and seminars, and we also had a system-wide new faculty teaching scholars at the time. And I think that FACET continues and evolves uh, and is very popular, is actually also to our success, Steve, isn't it? Now, now we are both doing other things and I have to put on my glasses and since I have to read this. Uh, since currently Steve is past chair of the faculty senate, will you come back? He is director <laughs> of the language, literature and rhetoric activities. Uh, he is co-chair of the UMKC internationalization task force on curricular and co-curricular activities and he's co-coordinator of the faculty diversity dialogue programs and he also has recently chaired a committee on UMKC's academic programs as part of UMKC forward and then also on his list is uh, he has gotten award an award from uh, the Kansas City Irish Fest governor uh, for excellence in education. And he's continuing this uh, Irish education uh, with us now. And uh, there's a book on the way, but uh, Steve will talk about that one. Glad to have you here. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, because of the, um, the libraries being closed down, the final push on my book has been stalled. Uh, it's dependent upon uh, archives that are held by the National Library of Ireland. So the book is using newspapers published in Dublin specifically between 1763 and 1921 to try and understand what people on the streets of Dublin knew about what was happening with the revolution. Um, and what I do is I go in um, sort of a, a week during a particularly major event and construct what was understood from that particular week. And so I jump from uh, 1782 to 1798 to 1829 to 1848 to 1867 to 1890 to then 1916. So it's a, it sort of jumps through history. And part of the challenge of the book is doing that long trajectory of history whilst making a kind of a coherent narrative that it can be sufficiently detailed to show what people on the street actually knew. So the basic, I'm using newspapers that people read. Um, often the newspapers were read maybe 20 times. Um, when you look at them, you can see how often they were read because the newsprint is smudged. Uh, typically, they would probably be delivered to a pub and then read out loud by whoever in the pub could read. Um, so anyway, so that's what I'm working with. What I'm doing today is just working with one particular publication um, that was called The Shamrock. Um, and I will share screen now. Um, so what I'm going to do, just so that if, if it might be distracting, but what I'm doing is I'm reading off one computer that's just behind the one that I have the laptop, the, um, the presentation on. So that you'll see the images sort of going through that coincide with the parts of the paper that I'm reading. 
so I'll read it. It'll take about 20 minutes if that's okay. Um, if you have questions as I go along, I'm perfectly happy for you to ask questions as I go along. I won't be able to see the chat though, I don't think. Um, I will take care of the chat if uh, people uh, bring, it issue, bring up issues. Sure, okay, thank you. Because so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read through what's on my screen that's behind this one computer, and then I'm gonna click through. So it's called Love, Wit and Valor in the Shamrock or how a magazine helped win the Irish Revolution. I think there was a typo where it was helped with the revolution. It's helped win the Irish Revolution. And what I'm doing is looking at this magazine. Um, it was called The Shamrock, a national weekly journal of Irish history, literature, arts, etc. Um, and my argument is it brought the cause of Irish nationalism to a young adult audience with a low intensity Republican rhetoric that was framed in terms of love, wit, and valor. Um, so it was founded in the autumn uh, before the 1867 rebellion, um, and that was, which is when the Fenians proclaimed um, a provisional Irish government. <clears throat> and at the time, the castle authorities, you know, the so in Dublin, there's the castle, and that's where British control was sort of centered in, in Dublin. And so we refer to that as the castle authorities. They controlled newspapers, they controlled the military, they controlled all things from Dublin Castle. Um, but the, the Shamrock defined its mission by invoking the races which have converged, verged, um, bear with me. Hang on, hang on, I've got to get this going. Yep. Go. Uh, no, uh, Steve, could yeah. you just, could you run it rather than uh... Uh, flicking through the slides like that. Could you run the uh, slideshow? Because uh, at the moment there's lots of stuff around it that is. Uh, bear with the me. I like this. I think if I do that, if you put okay, your, yeah. um, can you see that better? Sure. It's just that I have the 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 slides that tied in with the parts of the um the talk as i go through so okay um this is showing you the um it, the this is from the first issue of the shamrock and i'm going to talk about this poem obviously you can't see the poem but i'm going to quote from it i just wanted to show you that it was actually there on uh, the first the first issue uh, so they defined their mission by invoking the races which have converged from various lands to people island dedicating themselves to the effort to erect an open and honest platform where men of different religions and political views may meet, not to debate those views, but to mingle with each other in mental intercourse, social and elevating, and of good avail to the promotion of charity and peace. Really? Um, the, the editor, Richard Piggott, promised to give due honor not only to the strength, but also to the skill of Irish arms and hands and to glorify the achievements of the Irish mind, even above the feats of Irish muscle. From day one, the working principle of the magazine was to support the cause of Irish nationalism without directly challenging the establishment. Uh, they thus avoided the fate of John Mitchell's United Ireland in 1848 and James Stevenson's, St James Stevens, the Irish people in 1865 by applying the received idea of the Trinity um, which St. Patrick had turned into a symbol of Irish Catholicism. Um, so, I mean, so, so, so what, what was the genius of St. Patrick is that he came into Ireland as a kind of an evangelical uh, Catholic, and he took something that grew you know, everywhere across Ireland, the shamrock, and he used it as a symbol of um, the Trinity, and so what I'm arguing that the Shamrock magazine did is take that idea of the Trinity and turned it by using the idea of love, the idea of wit and the idea of valor. They created a coming together of three main trends of Irish nationalism that had been developing during the 19th century, but that had often been at odds with each other. And my argument about how a magazine like the Shamrock helped to further the Irish Revolution is that they help to weave those three threads together. That's the sort of the basic argument of, of, of this piece. Um, so as the poet Ulla 
put it in the shamrock on the editorial page of the first issue. This is the, the, the poem that you have in front of you. God prosper our sham shamrock, full sweet may it bloom, and it, with truth the free breezes of Erin perfume, may it grow to a union of races and creeds, like the emerald triplets that brighten our meads. I mean, it's not the greatest poetry. Um, you know, I know you might be, it's, it's sort of slightly doggerelish, but it is, argue, you know, it's arguing this case about the importance of bringing together these three threads. Um, so from the beginning, the Shamrock was aimed at the kind sons and daughters of our country, engaging them with stories of Irish arms and hands, with stories of beauty and with stories of wisdom. Um, issue one provided the first part of a biographical account of Robert Emmett, alongside an illustration of St. Patrick's arrival in Ireland um, and a poem celebrating St. Declan's Holy Well. The issue concluded with part one of a story about the outlawed chief. Um, these treatments of the, valor, the love of Patrick and the valor of Robert Emmett were set up by Thomas Caulfield Irwin's somewhat witty front page poem to the Shamrock. Um, so in stanza one, the poem describes the lovely land as a place where light, clime and soil, three happy gods are mingled in love as one. And then in stanza two, this three leafed offspring of the sun becomes a sacred isle that situates the martial men of air between, so island air, uh, between the immigrant saint who baptized the heathen and the invading host who brought thunderous war. Um, so, tested by the tumult death's pale ghost, the sons of noble Erin took solace in a third trinity, freedom, faith, and right, patiently awaiting the inevitable day when free peace and freedom will return to the land divine. It's not the greatest poetry, as I say, uh, but it's clever in its use of the shamrock as a conceit. Um, and so, um, if we uh, move forward, I just want to move forward, um, bear with me. Does that work like that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So this gives you a quick sort of uh, background to the to the to the magazine, and what I'm going to do is just look at the the um, the head plates um, as a way of talk the nameplate on the magazine. So this is what would appear on the the banner on the front page of the magazine when it was issued. And I'm just showing you the ways in which they graphically, visually represented this coming together of um, love, valor, and wit. Um, so you see in this nameplate, a gathering of distinct characters representing Ireland's hope for the future. The standard nameplate between 1866 and 1871 the showed the name of the magazine on cracked curved masonry with an angelic figure in the center. So the, the central character, can you see it when I do that with my? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, and so you have this sort of angelic figure in the center um, um, with a sort of a heart-shaped sh heart shamrock leaf making it seem as though she has wings, the shape of the masonry suggesting a rising sun. So this sort of idea of a rising sun here. The central figure studies a sheet of paper um, here, um, her right hand opening a gesture of, of, of declamation. To a right, a bare-footed soldier stands um, over here, um, leaning on his sword, looking directly at her, a, a young woman sits, hand on her chin, thinking to her left, um, hang on, an old man with a long beard and staff, um, a symbol of travel and wisdom, stands with his hand on the shoulder of a child, and a young man sits, intent on the young woman. Uh, there's a horizontal line that connects the eyes of the, man, the young man with the eyes of the young woman. Um, uh, so it's it, the characters suggest a gathering of soldierly valor, sage-like wit, and romantic love, thus reinforcing the array of stories typically printed in the magazine. That's the sort of um, so you see that you know when it comes to St. Patrick's Day, they have the you know the guys sitting around the table that they uh, are celebrating together, but then also in the magazine on the same day they're going to have stories about love, uh, people getting together. Typically the stories are pretty, you know, it'll be like a story about a young man who's very, very poor, who wants to marry the farmer's daughter, who's very, very rich. He goes off to America um, because she, the family won't have him. And then during the time he's away, they get hit by the famine. Uh, they become poor. He comes back from America, full, his, money, his pocket's full of money. 
and goes up to her and marries her anyway, and then saves the family. That's the sort of the uh, one, one of the uh, sort of the classic stories that are told told in the magazine. Um, so basically, let's as I go through um, the you know you have sort of um, this constant reinforcement of the idea of um, of love, wit, and valor um, in these stories. As the, as the magazine evolved, the nameplate went through a few variations in tr introducing additional elements. In December 1866, the one that you have in front of you, the nameplate turned the hearth into a stage complete with a mask, a scribe, and a harpist. Shamrocks decorate the proscenium arch, and beyond the arch at top left, um, just here, um, there's a graveyard and at top right, there's a riverscape with a rising sun. Again, this idea of the, sun, the rising sun as a symbol of the possibility of Ireland re-achieving independence is ubiquitous through this, through not just in the Shamrock, it was kind of a standard image. The, um, the Freeman's Journal, which is a much more mainstream newspaper, used the rising sun on its, its, um, on its uh, nameplate as well. Um, so at centre stage, a muse-like figure um, sits counselling a soldier who holds a sword and a female character with a Cupid-like figure at her feet. Um, by 1871, uh, the editors settled on a nameplate that would be used consistently until the change of ownership in June 1882. It was bought up by the Irish Land League in 1882, and so it changes um, in 1882. In this one, the name and the rays of the sun dominate, forming a sky sign draped with sprigs of shamrocks that grow from a central point, connecting with the source of the sun's rays. We are no longer at a hearth or next to a wall. Now the vision is of a sun rising across a rural landscape with hills and a river, caught casting its rays on a cemetery. Um, so the cemetery over here and a towering mon monument that you can just see over here. Um, when it was purchased by the Land League um, in June 1882, this is, uh, this is the, what the, the Land League uh, did. Um, they created the new nameplate where the rays of the sun were replaced with spears and the backdrop included two cannons with an array of flagstaffs. Uh, you can see these cannons just here and here. Um, you can see these pikes across the top, these spears across the top, um, and you can see there's piles of cannonballs um, down, down here, down here, and down here. Um, a male soldier and a female accomplice hold a banner with the name of the journal, um, so female the male, um, and three winged figures are posed in, in, in gestures of proclamation. Each wear a sat, wears a sash, indicate that valor is in the center, so valor, it, with love to the right and wit to the left. Um, the new journal was decidedly more activist, aiming to supply Irish readers with literature which might fearlessly be put into the hands of all, young and old, which should elevate as well as arouse, which, but which should never ignore the fact that love of con country is a sacred feeling. Um, as this mission suggests, the journal tapped into three main discourses of civil rights. And again, this is the core both of the book and of this particular chapter, this particular presentation, that it was deliberately working to create a unified understanding of the struggle for independence, making it accessible to a young literate audience with aspirations to more productive forms of agency. While DP, DP Moran, he's one of the kind of the professors who helped to articulate the, the cause of independence during the 1890s, he published a book called The Philosophy of Ireland in, eight, in 1900. Um, he, he framed it in terms of the battle of two civilizations, suggesting that the Irish lacked agency for the battle because they only read cheap periodicals and manifestly absurd romances. The editors at the Shamrock, however, focused their creative en energies on those who, as Moran puts it, ceased to read anything but newspapers when they left school. So Moran's point is that Ireland will never achieve its independence because the people who are you know at the age where they should be fighting the revolution are reading such bad stuff that they're never going to be inspired to uh, stand up and fight so moran was very skeptical about the possibility of a revolution my argument is that the edit editors of the shamrock knew exactly 
that that audience of people who had left school, who no longer read the history that they were being taught to read at school, were going to read a magazine like The Shamrock and could be influenced and cultivated uh, through the kinds of stories that they would publish in, in The Shamrock. Um, so, in other words, the editors accepted that the continuing education of the general populace was dependent upon periodicals, and they did their utmost to provide this non-academic this non-academic audience with an educational weekly publication. Um, so, um, Moran's attitude is consistent with an approach that focused on those who led the struggle rather than those who followed. Part of I should just give you a quick footnote. Partly this argument comes out of thinking about when 1916 happened, the Easter Rising, which you may be familiar with, um, it, initially it was very unpopular because they stopped the po post office from functioning and that meant that they also stopped people from getting their paychecks from the war. And so the wives of the soldiers who had gone off to fight in, 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 in you know, Verdun and the Somme were not getting their paychecks. And so they were, they were annoyed when the um, rebels were being led out of the post office and being led out of um, the various buildings that they had, that they, they had besieged, um, they had occupied. The, the argument is that within two weeks when the British came in and just started shooting people, um, with sort of a summary military trial and then two weeks later started to execute people, that that's what turned the Irish against the British and then led to the revolution in 1919 that led to independence in 1921. I don't see that as being an adequate explanation. And so what I'm doing is digging back into sort of six or seven, eight generations previous to that to try and understand the kind of the accumulated understanding of Irishness and Ireland that led to the people sort of galvanizing around the independence movement in the period between 1916 and 1921. And I just don't think the summary justice that the British meted out in 1916 is the same as they did, you know, <laughs> every time there was a rebellion going through for the previous 200 years. So there's no reason why that should have been the thing that triggered it. I'm trying to ex come up with a different explanation um, for, for, for why this happened. Um, so Moran's attitude is consistent with an approach that focused on those who led the struggle rather than those who followed. When the elite joined cultural societies, frequented salons in 18th century houses, I'm quoting from a poem by Yeats called um, Easter 1916, and argued in the bars on Baggett Street, um, or went on language and culture retreats in Sligo, or attended plays at the Abbey Theatre, the vast majority of those who put their lives on the line during the final years of the struggle of independence received their anti-colonial education from weekly magazines like the Shamrock. Um, in the context of a society that had been systemically deprived of economic opportunities with a huge majority of those who stood to benefit from Irish dependence in poverty as a direct result of Anglo-Irish and British control over the economy, it is no surprise that post-school reading was mainly comprised of cheap accessible publications that were passed from hand to hand or read aloud in pubs and meeting halls. Even before the journal was taken over by the Land League, the characteristic engravings and accompanying the stories of rom romance, politics and war made it very popular, allowing the editors to claim widespread support. And as they put it, since the palmy days of the Irish Penny Journal, no Irish per periodical has been sustained by the appreciation and patronage of the people of this country as the Shamrock has been. It has attained a riper age than even that most successful journal above referred to, which is um, you know, the, um, the, the, the Irish uh, uh, independence. So after the Land League took over in 1882, the journal became even more glamorous in its representations of Irish culture three times a year in special numbers of some, for St. Patrick's Day, Christmas, and the October anniversary of the magazine. The journal included colorized supplements as pullouts, often with a color front page. So that's what you're looking at here, is the color front page of an issue that was put out for St. Patrick's Day in 1884, two years after the Land League took over. Um, and it included colorized supplements as pullouts, often with a color front page. The editorial commitment to stories of love, valor, and wit remained. For example, St. Patrick's Day, 1884, the front cover expands 
on the hints of the nameplates to provide graphic illustrations of the, these three aspects of Irish nationalism. So I'm just going to go through and look cl more closely at each of these um, these parts. So this is the the upper part. Um, you see it costs tuppence, um, and you can see that the valor um, is a representation of yet another battle that the Irish lost, but which is represented as though they won. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is them going into um, carrying the flag that they carried into the battle um, in 1867, and you can see that they have the British on the run, um, and they're wearing their their their, their sort of uh, their traditional hats, and they've got the harp um, flag, and they're going into battle with the British running away. Um, it, so it shows a group of well-dressed, pike-armed Irishmen following the flag that had led them into the battle, battles in 1798, 1803, 1848, and 1867. They obey the signal to charge, ignoring the burst of a cannon as they chase English redcoats over the horizon, leaving an English soldier dead in the battlefield. battlefield. But valour was not enough. Um, Cupid flies, bow in hand, above the romance of a loving couple, blowing the sails of a, a, a swan-shaped boat. A green island loom, looms behind the couple as they cross the sea. The surge of the sea and the billowing sail hint at a turbulent Viking past, but there is a calmness that suggests confidence in the future. And then the other part of it, um, balancing out the Trinity, a group of five green flock frock wits celebrate over a bowl of punch offering a toast beneath a sign invoking the monks of the screw. You can't see that very well, but it's just there. It's that orange sign just there. It's a drinking club that was active in the final two decades of the 18th century, significantly the last time when Ireland had had an, a, an independent parliament was between 1782. Um, it was disbanded after the rebellion of 1798. So there was a two decades when they had an Irish parliament, it's right opposite Trinity College now, it's a, it's a bank now, but that was where the Irish Houses of in, uh, a Parliament stood um, in for, for almost two decades at the end of the 18th century. And the monks of the screw were kind of a group that was associated with that um, independent parliament. Um, most members were part of the Irish Patriot Party and they claimed their origins from a fifth century group that helped spread the word of St. Patrick across Ireland. Uh, the convivial image reinforces the importance of historically based political strategy as part of the ret rhetoric of nationalism, giving Irish patriots the license to enjoy a drink in St. Patrick's name, so that as long as they remember the importance of domestic stability and military valour. So, colon colorization um, reinforced the idea that the journal was, under its new management, addressing the needs of contemporary Ireland. As we see here, this is just a contrast between what they had in 1876 and what they had by 1886. And you oh. can see that the 1876 one is very kind of backward looking, nostalgic, um, using typography that is sort of designed to, en to, um, to invoke tradition. Oh, okay. the, the one in 1886 is using a much more modern uh, typography um, it's representing people wearing top hats and, uh, and you know, long jackets. Um, it's sort of celebrating sort of Ireland as a contemporary place that is working towards um, uh, its independence. Um, so as the top hats, Victorian suits and waistcoats suggest, the new management of the Shamrock was not entirely focused on rural Ireland. The journal now included multiple pages of advertising by Dublin-based industrial companies. Department in stores in Ireland had by this stage begun to capitalize on the commitment to homegrown industries and the full range of nationalist newspapers from the Freeman's Journal to the Shan Van Vocht included ads for Irish manufactured goods. In this case, the word Irish, so this, this, on this, this one on this side here, the word Irish appears six times in a full page advertisement and on turning the page, we find this magnificent ad for Hudson's Dublin whiskey. Um, using the monument to O'Connell, uh, that had been erected in 1882. Uh, what's really cool about this image is here's O'Connell here. The statue of O'Connell was only perhaps 25 feet high. 
the um, Nelson Monument behind it was actually the tallest structure in Dublin at the time. But the way they've represented it, O'Connell dwarfs Nelson. It's cool. It's a really cool representation. <laughs> um, the IRA, by the way, blowed up, blew, blew, sorry, blew up the um, Nelson Monument in about 1966. I should have the date on there. OK, so it's not that the new shamrock ignored history. Um, the journal addressed history uh, so as to rewrite it. Yeah, so as to rewrite it. I've already quoted the mission statement from the anniversary edition in October 1884 at the beginning of their 19th year, but it is worth returning to that edition for the splendid pictorial supplement given gratis with the new volume. Um, the relatively simple illustration of Patrick Sarsfield, the Lion of Limerick, riding his horse was billed as a magnificently colored equestrian portrait printed on fine paper and treated in the highest style of art. I mean, you can, th these, are, these are intended to be sort of carefully torn out and put on the walls of everybody's houses so that they could kind of reinforce this military uh, past um, that is being rewritten to reinforce a particular understanding of Irish history. Um, the colorist was from Northern Ireland. He was from Belfast. His name was J.D. Ray. Um, and you can see this is the Battle of Limerick. If, if any of you know, if you know anything about the Battle of Limerick, um, it was a crushing defeat for the Irish um, where, you know, the forces of William of Orange managed to besiege and then breach the walls of, of, of the city and take over the city of Limerick. And it was pretty much the end of Irish resistance to the cause of William of Orange during the 18, eight, between 1685 and, and 1692. Um, William of Orange was actually there, I believe in 1690. Um, and but, but you can see it's a representation here of the women of, of Limerick chasing the, the English soldiers away um, with the English flag in, in, in retreat and the Irish um, coming out and attacking them, um, which completely reverses what actually happened, just by the way. But you can stick it on your wall and you could put it there as a celebration of your, your Irishness. Um, the editorial explanation of the hero heroism of the women and the lion-hearted courage of the men suggests that the siege failed, that the English soldiers ran from the fury of the stone-throwing, cleaver-wielding women. Uh, you can see, I think, one of them here has a cleaver in her hand. The Irish harp and the Irish green overcoming the English lions and the English red. Um, at Christmas in 1886, eight, uh, Rees illustration, Ray's illustration was published without an explanation, except to say that it was a supplement gratis with the Christmas number. And the picture shows the Battle of Fontenoy in 1745. It was actually a battle that the Irish won. Uh, the Irish Brigade teamed up with the French to, to defeat the British and their allies. And the caption reads, revenge, remember Limerick, down with the Sassanac. Um, I don't know if you, any of you know um, that word, Sassanac. Do you, you know that word? It's it's a it's a it's an insult. Uh, you know, the Scots and the Irish like to use that word to refer to the English, um, and it's a deliberate insult. It's as insulting as the word Sioux used for um, Lakota or Dakota Nakota. Uh, they don't like that word because it's actually a word that was coined for them by I think the the Cherokee used it to describe the, um, the Sioux. Same thing with the Sassanac, it's a, it's a derogatory word. But you'll see that the dead English soldiers, the trampled Union flag, the surging Hibernian flag, the green frocked Irish soldiers leading the charge against a futile English cannon and the escaping ranks of English soldiers tell the story. Again, giving Irish households a historical image to stoke their love of country, their faith in valor, and their trust in the organizational strategies of their leaders. Um, two weeks later, the Shamrock also carried a supplement, this time showing the Battle of Ulat Hill from the 1798 rebellion. Again, Ray's illustration comes without explanation. And again, the English professional soldiers run, their horses and guns useless as they are overwhelmed by an army of pike wielding, pitchfork carrying Irish civilians. Um, again, this is not the way the battle actually went, but it's the way in which it was represented. So 
I think I'm going to stop there because I think I've given you enough kind of sort of detail, enough sort of an, a suggestion of my argument. And it might be best now if we go to you having questions and we just have a conversation, if that's OK. You good? I think that took a lot bit longer than I thought it might. But that's OK. So should I stop share and then. So thank you for listening. That's a take that I think that gives you the overall contours of my of my research there and the way in which I'm using it as as part of an argument about what happened with the Irish Revolution. Hey Ed. Hi, I've got a, a, a quick a quick question. When did the English or British, whoever came in initially into Ireland, come in and take over? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with Irish history. I think yeah, you would know it much better than we do than I do. Well, it's a long history. I mean, the yeah. the early early invaders who we would call English were actually Normans, mm -hmm. uh, so Strongbow. Uh, back in about 1080, um, 1085, came over and was kind of accepted in as the as the leader of the Irish, and and then there was a rebellion against it, and so there were backwards and forwards. But really, it starts with the Normans, and then go, goes through the real sort of establishment of Ireland as a as a colony that served the interests of, of England was really mostly established during Henry VIII into, so the um, 14, you know, the, so the, the 1500s through to the, to the 1600s between sort of Henry VIII and right. Elizabeth I, and then James I of England, James wow. VI of Scotland, really went in fairly hard and, 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 and that was when the main resistance to English rule was kind of run out of the country. There was a thing called the Flight of the Earls in 1607, I believe is the date. Um, and then there were sub subsequent invasions to kind of consolidate and create control where the, during the 17th century, the English established plantations where they forcibly removed um, Catholics from the land and gave the land to soldiers who were loyal to the crown or to Presbyterians who were brought in from Scotland, um, um, various kinds of Protestants who came in from Scotland. So actually the northern part of Ireland had been the most Irish part of Ireland um, up until about 1600 and then it was systematically dis, you know, dis, you know, dis depopulated and the, uh, the Catholics were pushed off to Kerry and to sort of pretty relatively poor land down in the southwest of Ireland, the west of Ireland, and then in Donegal. And the English sort of established rule through farm farmland and through building roads and building a sort of a, an economic structure that was designed just to suck all the resources out of Ireland. So that was really established in the 1700s. Cromwell went um, and sort of committed genocide up and down the island. Um, William of Orange went and committed genocide up and down the island. So by the beginning of the 18th century, English rule was pretty almost hegemonic. Um, and then you have during it. So in 1800 is when Ireland becomes part of the United Kingdom of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. So the Act of Union is what during the 19th century they're fighting against because they want to become an independent kingdom. Does that help? Yes, absolutely, yeah. A, a good quick lesson. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks for asking the question, Ed. Thank you, yeah. No, sorry, I should have thought to give that context before I started. So, Betsy. Um, I have a question that just hit me when you were talking about William of Orange. Yes. The new flag, green, white, and orange, I know was to bring peace from the north Ireland to the South Ireland. Is yeah. orange the color for William of Orange? Yeah, yeah, that is the traditionally the college of the orange men as they became known. So, you know, every July, which is marching season in the northern part of Ireland, uh, some people call it Northern Ireland. I tend to avoid that name just to register um, sort of a question mark over the relationship between not what was established in in 1922 well actually 1921 December 
under the treaty that ended the, the War of Independence, Northern Ireland was separated off into a separate group of six counties. They only took sort of um, six of the, um, the, the, the nine counties of Ulster and turned it into a separate country. And it's ruled, by, it's, it's dominated more by people who call themselves orange men. And they do, they, they kind of, they use, it comes from William of Orange, um, actually, um, who was like King Billy, who they, you know, riding a big white horse coming in to save the Irish from Catholicism. Uh, that's and so yeah, but see, you're right, Betsy, that the flag, the tricolor, was designed. It, it, they previously for the, for the for the Irish nationalist movement had used that green flag with the harp on it, harp. Mm -hmm. and it, it was it was when Sinn Fein was formed in 1900, and then going through to the um, Civil War, the, to the to the War of Independence, that they coined that flag with the tricolor, you know, that brings together the orange, the green, and the white as the sort of the, the neutral point that joins them together. Stephen, um, you have your book, or at least the way you talked about it, to argue about the importance of these daily uh, or weekly newspapers and uh, things like that. Are you in a majority that uh, argues that point, or is this a minority fight? <laughs> that's a good question that's a good question no it it's it's sort of gained traction um the, the 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 dominant narrative about the irish war of independence and the and the revolution was that it had been um initiated and led by people like william butler yates and um and and douglas hyde and by a kind of a you know a, a, an elite if you will an educated elite Often they were Anglo-Irish um, who were sort of at the at the front of the crowd that was fighting the fight. I think a lot more people have started to pay attention to the importance of Irish newspapers and to the different organisations that sort of brought the um, the thinking, the struggle down to quote unquote the people. So the the Gaelic Athletic Association. Um, so the sporting kind of clubs and other places. So I think it's when I, the last time I went to a conference, <laughs> which was two years ago, um, people sort of questioned whether or not is, you know, the Shamrock was any more important than the Freeman's Journal, but there was no real question about whether or not these, these magazines and these journals, these newspapers were significant in galvanizing an understanding of Ireland and Irishness during the period. Thank yeah. you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So Robert, and then I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know. I see Sully, and I'm not, I'm not sure I know your name. So Maureen. Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Uh, so so we'll go Robert, and then Maureen. Thank you. So uh, how did the British uh, react to the Shamrock, especially looking at the pictures where the opposite outcome happened in battles? Was there a movement to shut down the paper? Uh, no, that no, they see they managed to fly beneath the radar. Um, they were the, the British were going after the much more radical newspapers. That, you know, um, you know the um, Shan van Vocht, for example, was much more gained more attention. The Freeman's Journal occasionally gained attention. I mean, they would go after them. Um, you know, I mean, during the eighteen forties, eighteen fifties through the sixties, they had you know gone in fairly often and, sh and, and smashed presses completely. Um, they wielded control through the taxes that they could put on the, on the paper, the taxes they could put on the newsprint um, and, you know, the, and cens you know, censorship they could do and, and fines that they could do for violations, but they didn't really seem to pay too much attention to the Shamrock. I think that's why I kind of like it is because it kind of got to a young audience it managed to represent itself as, you know, arguing for, you know, culture um, and for romance. And the military side of it was kind of, you know, you know, contextualized within that framework. Whereas the, the ones that the British were really going after, the castle authorities <clears throat> were going after, were much more militant 
uh, much more, more kind of much less subtle in their in their in the, the arguments they're making. Though I know you look at these these posters that you know these pull out posters, they don't they're not very subtle, but but I, they didn't pay. It's it's like they just didn't pay attention. I think. It's a good question. I mean, I, I probably have. If I, I mean, I'll, I'll when I go back to Dublin, I'll ask that question of some of my contacts and see if they do know of any evidence of of the British going and and trying to sort of shut them down. But I've I've never heard of any evidence of that. So, does that give you? Yeah. So, Maureen. Yes. Then, um, well, then, Robert asked my first question, so you've answered that. But my other question is, I don't know what the Land League is. Oh, yeah. so during the 80, after the 1867 rebellion, um, a lot of the, um, the perpetrators migrated off to America, went to live in Boston and Philadelphia and New York. And there was the the um, there was a, a fundraising campaign to raise money to support a political process to move towards independence that eventually became known as the Home Rule Movement. And Parnell was at the kind of forefront of that, Charles Stuart Parnell. So he was a politician. Um, he led the Irish Parliamentary Party, but he was also the president of the Land League. And they were, they raised money, they put out pamphlets in 1880 through 1882. They ran afoul of the British authorities and were, many of them were put in prison um, into Kilmarnham um, in Dublin. And they, so they were kind of like a, they were like a political organization uh, that was fighting for um, the reduction of rents um, they were fighting against um, absentee landlordism. Uh, they were fighting for tenants to be able to renew their leases um, if they had sort of farmed the land in good faith and if they had paid their rents on time, that they couldn't just be evicted simply because the landlord chose to, to evict them. So they were arguing for, but it was a political movement. But in 1880, they started up a boycotting campaign um, and a sort of a conscientious objection campaign and the British didn't like it and so put a lot of them in prison. And then they signed a, a thing called the Kilmarnham Agreement in 1882 that then allowed them to all come out and then start up with the political process again, which then Parnell led, it, led um, through the Irish Parliamentary Party and then he was sort of forced to fall from power in 1890 uh, for a set of complicated reasons. But does that, but yes, so they were, the, the Land League was sort of a political organization that was trying to establish changes to the law in order to protect Irish um, um, tenants. Thank you. There was also a, there was also a ladies Land League, as they called themselves, that's really, really fascinating and interesting, that took the place of the Land League when all the men were in prison between 1818 and 1882. And they, for example, published um, the, the newspaper of the Land League at that time, which was um, called the United Irishman, I believe. Uh, and they actually did the printing and the publication. They did all kinds of, they built, I mean, the, the Women's Land League, they, they, they actually built huts like 200 of them, prefabricated huts that they would transport around the country and take to the place of somebody who was being evicted from their cottage. And they would give them a temporary cottage, uh, sort of house to live in, a hut to live in for the period of time when they could take it to court and potentially get their right to their land back. Um, so they did all kinds of wonderful things, but, but yeah, anyway, so Linda. Well, I, a very minor footnote kind of question. Uh, we, what is the history of the term wild kerns and gallow glasses? <laughs> wild, wild turns and gallow glasses. Well, you know, a gallow glass is a is like a bodyguard. A gallow glass. Hmm? It's, it's like a bodyguard. Oh, okay. A gallow glass is a um, is somebody who protects the king. So Cahulam was a um, was a gallow glass for uh, Connor the king. But with the term, well, I don't know where it comes from. Oh, probably... okay. Well, it's in, in uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One or Part Two, and I took I 
think it's usually footnoted to mean Irish mercenaries. Um, so, but uh, well, one person's bodyguard is another person's mercenary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right. <laughs> uh, but I was just interested in in it, uh, we're well, Kern probably not, but is gallow glass is an Irish word, isn't it? It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they were referring to a real, a real phenomenon. Yes, yes. The, what, and the first one is can't. I don't know that word. I don't know where that comes from. But I Gallagher, I know for sure. Yeah, I think it's spelled K E R N in Shakespeare. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'll look that one up after. But Gallagher, I know for sure because okay. Cahulam was a Gallagher, um, you know, for King Connor. Okay. So um, yes. See, um, um, uh, Stephen, you sort of represented, uh, or you you seem to indicate that one of the toughest crackdowns in Ireland was was by the Scottish elements of the of the of the British army. This was after uh, Culloden and the Scottish rebellions all finished, right? Well, it started with you know, so James the first of England was also James the sixth of Scotland. Yes. Yes, and he came up with the bright idea. He so he was, you know, I mean, like his history is is complicated because his mother was was Roman Catholic and he was raised Catholic, mm -hmm. and so when he came on the crown after Elizabeth, there was this idea that he was going to be lenient towards Catholics, and in fact, in like 1603, 1604, they did a census where they got the Catholics to kind of identify themselves. And then the gunpowder plot in 1605 um, led to a serious crackdown against Catholics. And James rewarded the Scottish soldiers who had stayed loyal to him by giving them land in oh. Ireland when he sent in his, his troops into Ireland starting in 1607. And there was the flight of earls. So the Irish earls who had resisted um, James then left between 1607 and 1608 and their land that was left, left absent was given to those loyal soldiers. So this and is so all the, before this, Culloden. And, this is before, so Culloden yeah, and, not, and Culloden kind of the suffer, you know, yeah. Because I thought it was yeah. kind of ironic that the, the Scottish apparently suffered a lot after that. Well, um, that, yeah, that would be the Scottish from the Highlands and the yes. Scottish, I mean, I mean, if you know about Culloden, uh, the Duke of Cumberland, who 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 perpetrated the sort of the the genocide after the Battle of Culloden, oh, no, no. Um, was his soldiers were Lowland Scots, so they oh, were actually Scottish, see. but they were know, Prot Protestant. It was Protestant Scots oh, fighting no. against Catholic Scots, essentially, or Lowland Scots fighting against Highland Scots. Um, so all the families that were wiped out, um, you know, during the, those days of Culloden, were um highland mm -hmm. families that were were catholic in their in their religion so well, it's a good thing so that, they, that, that there are no more religious wars huh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was was it was sort of a mixture though of, of religious and political with the stuarts well that's right that's right yes it was a, it was a mixture of and it, but it was all about loyalty and there was this you know as after the 1605 gunpowder plot there were a series of, of, of acts that were passed that made it that you, in order to be a loyal Englishman who was loyal to the crown, you had to be Anglican. You had to swear allegiance to the articles of faith of the Anglo-Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And that meant that then you could start to identify. They were kind of the dissenters who were the, ten, the, the Scots tended to be dissenters were given sort of a free pass depending on how much loyalty they showed towards the crown. But if they started to get too uppity, they were, they were suppressed themselves as well. Uh, they were forced to go and share, swear allegiance to, the, to, to, to the, you know, the Anglican church and to sort of show up on Sunday, um, at least. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a complicated, yeah. long footnote there. Well, so what else, what else do we have? Any other questions? I'm happy to talk about any part of this. Okay, I've got a really simple one. Um, the the coloration of those plates and the and the and the, and the occasional covers. How was that done? Was that like with a printing press using multiple color? Um, yeah, it, I, I think that is a really really interesting question for somebody who does art history. 
Um, I all I did <laughs> find out. Yeah, no, honestly, all oh, I did find out, Ed, is that once the Land League bought the Shamrock in 1882, they could afford to do that kind of colorization. And I, from what I can tell, they were one of the first magazines to start doing it in that fairly complicated way where they're using multiple colors. Um, but from what I understand, it's, it's hand done on a plate and then printed on, but they only would do it where they, they would do it on the front cover and then the back cover. And then they would occasionally put in this sort of, well, three times a year, they would put in this, this, this gratis, poster that you kind Centerfold. of uh, so it's always cool because as you're going through looking through it you never know when you're going to find one and suddenly you open up a page and it, it probably hasn't been opened since the you know since the archives um you know sort of shelved it away and then you're opening up this very carefully you know you always call the 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 archivist over and say is it okay if i open this and you know he or she sits and sort of gently sort of puts their gloves on and opens it up and and lets you take a picture of it, which is what I was able to do. But anyway, so, but yeah, it's a really interesting history. I'd love to know exactly, you know, when they bought the actual printing press that allowed them to do that. Um, I suspect though it was in 1882 when they got, the Land League, one of the things I, in Maureen's question, they raised money in church, um, a penny at a time they would, you know, they would go to the congregate, the priest would ask the congregation, in addition to putting in your money in the basket for the, for the, for the church, can you also donate a, a halfpenny or a penny or a farthing, whatever you can afford to the land league. And so they actually, it, it followed on, you know, Dan, uh, Daniel O'Connell had done that during the 1830s, during the kind of the Catholic emancipation movement. And they kind of revived that idea where you just went and you got small subscriptions and then the idea was you use that money to support people who were being evicted, help them go to court to get their land back or to get their cottage back. You know. So, yeah. Thanks. The word boycott, by the way, comes from Captain Boycott. Um, he was a, an Anglo-Irish Anglo farmer who the local population decided not to do any business with him. And so they boycotted him. Yeah. So... <laughs> cancel culture <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly cancel culture exactly but it's actually it's it's sort of one of the ways in which i connect the you know conscientious objection of the irish during the 19th century that leads to um mahatma gandhi um who knew he he knew quite intimately the details of how the irish achieved their independence when he was trying to achieve independence for India. And it's really, really cool that then, you know, Martin Luther King sort of picked up on what Mahatma Gandhi was doing. And then during the, 18, the 1960s in Ireland, they developed a civil rights movement that was based on Martin Luther King. So they kind of re-imported some of their own ideas, but yeah. Sully's got a question. Yeah. Oh, Sully. Hi, Sully. Hi. Um, Say, so, um, how uh, you you were talking to Sully about the Scots, and uh, how how did the Irish view the Scots? Was it as and other people who were being oppressed by England, or um, did did they view them as uh, allies or not or um, I think the answer is differently depending upon who they were. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, some Scots, I mean, one of the really interesting things about the, so the, vol, the there was a, the Irish volunteers um, during, so we're going back to 1760, the 1760s into the, into, into the 1770s, the Irish volunteers actually were based in, in Belfast and came down from Belfast. The British kind of allowed them to come in because the British soldiers were off fighting the French and the Americans. And so they'd left a vacuum of, of military control and they trusted the Scots dissenters 
more than they trusted the Irish Catholics. And so they brought them in as a group that kind of filled the military control gap. But what's really interesting is then the dissenters started to ask for a vote in the 1770s, and they became a kind of a, 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 a nationalist movement themselves that then said, well, if we deserve the vote, so do Catholics. And so you, there's this sort of, so there, there's a movement where the Irish volunteers who were predominantly you know, Scottish descended Irish from the North, took along with them as a matter of political principle, the emancipation call for Irish Catholics. And that's how the Irish parliament came about in 1882, because it was, it was a coming together of some prominent Anglo-Irish ascendancy people with dissenters and then with some Catholics who started to come forward. Um, so Henry Grattan and Isaac Butt and those sort of um, politicians sort of were, were had the power of the, the dissenters behind them. But then there were others that, you know, now you can see that the, the fight in, in the north of Ireland is between, Pres you know, people descended from Presbyterian Scots and people who are Irish Catholic. So, that, so it's not all, but there are some. James Connolly, for example, in the Easter Rising was a Scot, but he was on the side of the Irish nationalists um, so it's a complicated question, Sully. I'm sorry to be a bit sort of, you know, not too clear in answering it. Is well, that a, are you good, Sully? No. Yes, it is. Thank yeah. you. You're, well, you're welcome. So Linda, hi. Oh, just, well, of course, in the early Middle Ages, it was really blurred because this, the Scots were Irish who uh, uh, basically both religiously, Melinda's Farn and Iona and so forth, but uh, in terms of settling the land and pushing the Picts mm -hmm. further and further east. The Picts had occupied oh. much of Scotland and then the, mm -hmm. the Scotty came from, from Ireland and pretty much eclipsed Pictish culture. Mm. Yeah, there's very very little evidence left of Pictus culture. I mean, so it well, was so, finding, so they're finding, yeah, they're finding more and more. Um, but it tended to be wooden, so uh, it tended to be a wooden-based uh, culture. So it's it's hard to find things that are preserved that give you a sense of how they live. But still, yeah, the Picts yeah. were, yeah, yeah. The, actually, there is quite a bit of of stonework. Uh, there's something called the Pictish Trail. In fact, that you can go look at Pictish stones if. That's well, what moves you. Next time I go to Scotland, I'll do that. <laughs> Maybe two, two, 2022. <laughs> well, the other interesting argument, which is made linguistically, is that the Picts, um, whose their stonework depicts uh, elephants and giraffes and so on, that they were uh, Phoenician originally. So that's oh, who, you know, who moved up the Atlantic coast. Well, interesting because in at New Grange in in Ireland, which is one of the the ancient um, burial sites, there is a depiction of a a, sh a boat that looks very much like an Egyptian mm -hmm. um, you know boat that you see on the pyramids, um, and th so there's an argument that it was a connect a direct connection between the Egyptians. And a sort of a group that moved all the way along the Mediterranean, all the way up the coast of the, the, the western coast of Europe, and then across to Cornwall potentially, and then over to Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, that's an, hmm. that's the tin culture uh, connection. Steve? Yes, I think so. Yes, yeah, that is part of that is yeah. For the bronze uh, making bronze, they needed the tin right. from uh, England. Right. Cornwall specifically. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, seeing no more. Oh, Sully. Uh, hey, Sully. Um, this is a somewhat random question, but uh, my family a long time ago came from the Isle of uh, Man, which is in between oh, cool. England and Ireland. Um, were they involved at all in the goings on between England and Ireland, or were they kind of secondary that they didn't bother uh, the English didn't bother them and the Irish didn't bother them? 
I, I mean, it's a great question. My my understanding is that they kept themselves to themselves. Uh, they were, you know, they're on an island and they didn't really need to um, to get involved. Okay. Um, they have a distinct form of 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 of, Gwali, uh, of Gaelic that they speak. So there definitely were connections between them and the the people you know the people we're talking about who came to Cornwall, to Ireland, to Wales, um, and to Scotland. I mean, so that there were different forms of of, of, of Gaelic spoken. The, the one in, in in the Manx you know language that you you know is quite distinct. So I know that. So there was a, I think there was a tendency for them to be isolated. Um, I don't know whether it's deliberate or simply because it's just so it's sort of it is just naturally, you know, an island that is separated off. The only thing I really know about the Isle of Man is the TT races. Uh, it's where the, <laughs> the, 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 the English during the 1920s and 30s like to go and race their motorcycles to test yeah. them out. <laughs> you know, to and, and I think they, they have a f flag, which is a real cool flag. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I, I I should know more about the Isle of Man. So thanks for the question. I'll. That's a good one. Oh, I just think on the on a linguistic family tree, my understanding is that Manx is more closely related to Cornish than other oh. Celtic languages, as it would not be surprising given its given its position. And with it's within recent years, the last living speaker, a native speaker of Manx, died. Oh. Within recent memory. Okay. No more questions. Thank you all. And Steve, thank, thank you, you Steve. very much for a very interesting uh, story. And for, answer, and for answering all of our questions. That yeah, really thank didn't you. Have that much <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the great Thank question. you. Thank you. This was really nice and good seeing you all. Yep. And uh, we'll meet in a month again and come back. <laughs>